Hello, my name is Lucas, this is Bit of Lit, and I'm here to talk about Homicide, Life on the Killing Streets by David Simon, who you might know as a writer or producer for many HBO shows such as The Wire, uh, The Coroner, Generation Kill, The Deuce, uh, The Plot Against America, mm, Treme, I feel like I said that one already. <laughs> um, uh, I think there's one or two more that uh, I, I haven't watched, so I don't know. Um, I also have not watched Treme, but I know of it, and I want to watch it next. Um, in due time, in due time. Anyway, I've been a big fan of his work since I watched The Wire a couple of years ago, and then The Coroner, and The Deuce, and Generation Kill, and um, The Plot Against America. And so, before we get into it, uh, David Simon, before he was a writer uh, for many, many, and producer for many, many HBO shows, uh, he was a reporter for the Baltimore Sun, and this book, Homicide, A Life on the Killing Streets, is about the year that he spent in 1988 with the Homicide Unit. Uh, as they tried to solve the 200 plus cases that came to them. And, you know, it's about as bleak as you can imagine. Uh, because, you know, some of the cold, callous murders uh, that are <laughs> presented uh, that uh, to the reader and that the detectives work on are just heartbreaking and just so cruel. Um, and also, that's not the only bleak, bleak part. What is also bleak is, in many respects, how the homicide unit functions uh, due to uh, all sorts of pressures, political pressures, media pressures, and, and uh, intra-departmental pressures um, from top down, basically uh, shit rolling downhill <laughs> um, from the top brass. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really sort of honest look at what it's like to work, uh, what it was like uh, being around these uh, detectives and all the shit they used to talk to each other. Um, and the really, really gallows humor that a lot of these guys adopted uh, to deal with the horrors that they uh, see and deal with. Um, certainly there's a lot of ego on the line for some of these people who are motivated to uh, beat the opponent, in a sense, uh, that being the killer, uh, proving that he's not that smart. Uh, the detective wants to, a detective in many cases, uh, take your pick which one, wants to solve the case to prove that they're smarter than the killer. Uh, seems to be the motivating factor many, many times. And uh, it's kind of strange to think like that would be the prime motivating factor for a, a homicide detective. But uh, that's the way it seems often, and um, you know it gets it gets results certainly as you see in the book. Uh, there are a couple cases that you see throughout. Um, there's this sort of Black Widow case of this older woman who's uh, <laughs> she sort of by the end of that uh, she tries to plead insanity in a way or make it look like she's insane. Uh, so she can later plead insanity, uh, has had many husbands that have had life insurance policies, and all of a sudden, they're all gone. They've been... Uh, there's also uh, the Angel in Reservoir Hill case with uh, Latonya Wallace, an 11-year-old girl who was found um, killed and sexually assaulted 
and all these things. And this is all this, some of these cases are really, really great as a through line to get you through each chapter, making you wonder what's going to happen next. Um, uh, but you know, they are heartbreakers. They're, uh, really bleak. And that's why I had to take a couple months to read this because it was just a lot to handle. Uh, the writing is excellent, uh, and really thorough. And you do get to feel for these men that worked in the homicide unit, um, and see their humanity, uh, and, you know, see, you know, it, it, the, the institution that they work in uh, does sort of grind you down and has its own sort of inertia and is going a certain direction. Uh, and leads to some unfortunate truths, we shall say. Uh, there are reasons that... Uh, <laughs> the cops are not trusted and uh yeah it's just uh it gets into police brutality and um how did homicide detectives do everything they can to manipulate uh, a confession because they have a board in the baltimore police department uh where you put the names of people that have been called up uh, as and found as murdered. Um, and they're red when the case is unsolved, and they're black when the case is solved. And there's a certain need for a high national average or better clearance rate, uh, especially by the top brass, and this kind of pressure can be... Uh, very difficult and cause a lot of um, extra overtime and anger and bitter feelings. And there are times where these detective sergeants or uh, what have you, um, lieutenants or whatever, push their, their underlings, so to speak, to do things uh, that... Um, Are, are a lot to handle and sometimes leave them out uh, to suffer consequences in a way if you read it you'll know what I'm talking about um, I'm trying not to spoil too too much but um, there are certain pressures and demands that need to be met and uh, it, yeah it's just bleak uh, there are also rules throughout not only are there a couple cases that go throughout uh, and there's really great sort of philosophical uh, bits here and there about the reality of working on the streets uh, as a homicide detective. Um, there are these rules, and I've got the list right here. Just to give you an idea of um, this bleak institution that is affected and affects and exerts its own pressure while it's being exerted upon um, by other forces, other institutions. Number one, everyone lies. Murderers lie because they have to. Witnesses and other participants lie because they think they have to. Everyone else lies for the sheer joy of it. And to uphold a general principle that under no circumstances do you provide accurate information to a cop. Number two, the victim is killed once, but a crime scene can be murdered a thousand times. Number three, the initial 10 or 12 hours after a murder are the most critical to the success of an investigation. Number four, an innocent man left alone in an interrogation room will remain fully awake, rubbing his eyes, staring at the cubicle walls, and scratching himself in dark, forbidden places. A guilty man left alone in an interrogation room goes to sleep. Number five, it's good to be good. It's better to be lucky. Number six, when a suspect is immediately identified in an assault case, the victim is sure to live. When no suspect has been identified, the victim will surely die. Number seven. First, they're red. Then, they're green. Then, they're black. This one is referring to the names. Uh, first, they're in the red. Then, money comes through and is funneled in to work the cases. And then, hopefully, they're in the black. And they improve the clearance rate. Um, 
in any number eight in any case where there is no apparent suspect the crime lab will produce no valuable evidence in those cases where a suspect has already confessed and has and been identified by at least two eyewitnesses the lab will give you print hits fiber evidence blood typings and a ballistic match number nine to a jury any doubt is reasonable the better the case the worse the jury a good man is hard to find but 12 of them Gathered together in one place is a miracle. Number 10, there is, there is too such a thing as a perfect murder. Always has been, and anyone who tries to prove otherwise merely proves himself naive and romantic. A fool who is ignorant of rules 1 through 9. And those last two are uh, really critical. There is a uh, detective in here that seems to be doing all the best he can. Uh, out of his own stubbornness and effort. Uh, he's having a perfect clearance rate year, and then he catches the perfect murder, and there's no leads, there's nothing, there's no, hardly any evidence. <laughs> um, and the jury, uh, there's this really interesting uh, court uh, case, uh, case that goes to court, and the jury, I mean, my God, <laughs> it, the way the jury works two people want to convict this person of first murder uh, a lot of other people don't trust the cops for varying reasons um, many of them that the cops sort of forced uh, evidence through or forced, forced this or forced that and they just don't trust cops and other people just didn't care at all about the results um, and it was very important to uh, McClarney, um, one of the detectives, and anyway, the they all decide at the end of the day, the reason that they come to agreement is that they just want to go home. So they convict, they get the right conviction for the wrong reasons. And <laughs> time and time again, you see this kind of thing. Um, things are done for the wrong reasons uh, that get results, or things are done for the wrong reasons and don't get results or for the right reasons and get no results or just it's a good book <laughs> uh i am going to eventually even though i've watched the hbo series uh the corner i'm gonna read the corner uh his book co-written with ed ed what is ed Ed something. I forget. I forgot. I don't remember. Uh, who knows? But I will be reading it. It's going to come to me in a moment. And it is... The Corner of a Year in the Life of an Inner City Neighborhood. Ed Burns. I knew I had something with a B. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Bye.